Welcome back, Inebriites. This is Andy, the Inebriar Podcast, and I am once again recording from uh, deep in my COVID bunker, uh, staying away from as many humans as possible. Uh, so we have with us today, Bob McClure. Welcome to the show, Bob. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Bob is a stand-up comedian based out of LA, correct? Yep. Yep. Uh, but not originally. You're from, was it Ohio? I'm originally from, yeah, a little town, uh, kind of between Akron and Cleveland in Northeast Ohio. It's, you know, small-ish, about 20,000 people or so called Hudson, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I lived in, uh, I lived in Cleveland for about four years before I moved to Los Angeles. So what, what was it about comedy? Well, like, how, were you always into stand-up comedy? Were you a Saturday Night Live guy? Um, like, what was, what was the initial spark? <laughs> you know, be, like, believe it or not, I tell a lot of people this story, and it's, it's kind of wacky. I saw an episode of the Nickelodeon's cartoon Doug when I was a kid. Oh, sure. Like four or five years old, yeah, where Doug did – stand-up comedy at his school talent show. And I just remember being a little kid and being like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. Wow. That looks so cool. That's funny. You don't get a lot of comedians uh, that are like, oh, my major influence is Doug. Funny. Yeah, right. (laughs) Um, So, like, uh, you know, I used to gather people around at, like, family reunions and and parties and stuff like that and, you know, do stand-up. I would tell little, you know, knock-knock jokes and why the chicken crossed the road and that kind of stuff. And, um you know, did talent shows and everything when I was a kid. Um, where I really got into stand-up comedy was when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I took my birthday money and bought John Panette's first album, Show Me the Buffet. John and Panette? I'm not even sure if I John know Panette him. was a, he was a bigger dude. He's, uh, he died about four or five years ago uh, okay. in Pittsburgh, rest his soul. Uh, he was a bigger dude, came out of Baltimore, um, who just talked about being a big dude and he talked a lot about food, but he talked about it in a way that was like deeply relatable to me Mm -hmm. as growing up as kind of like a, like a chubby kid. Yeah. Um, and in a way that, that kind of gave me a a positive look on myself and not, you know, you know, you grow up the big kid, you know, you, you tend to take your, your fair share of licks. Sure. Um, but, uh, listening to that album, I was like, Oh, this is something that I can, I can do this and, and, and I can, I can talk to people this way and I can take, you know, take the things that people are saying about me and make them funny. And it's a way to relate to people and connect to people. And I used to put his CD in a little uh, green CD player radio that I had gotten for Christmas one year. And I would turn the volume down really low because I didn't have headphones and I would set it right next to my head and I would just on loop, listen to, listen to this album as I was falling asleep. And then the next night I'd pick up where I had left off the night before and could just matter of fact, I was just in the car with my girlfriend and one of the, one of the bits from it came on and I recited it word for word. I still knew it. So uh, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. Like um, that kind of difference between musicians and comedians where like a musician, you want to hear that song over and mm-hmm. over again, where like a comedian, you mm-hmm. kind of want to hear new stuff, but I feel like they're, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, comedians and there are certain bits like, uh, uh John Mulaney's bit about the salt and pepper diner. I don't know. If you love that, that bit. Oh, yeah, I love that it's bit. It's killer. And like, it yeah. still makes me laugh. It's, it's perfect. And it's a time, that's a timeless bit too. Yeah. I mean, that's oh, one of yeah. those, that's one of those nuggets that you find and you're like, oh, I can just tell this forever. I can tell this no matter my size, gender, race, socioeconomic status. Like that bit is funny to everyone all the time forever. Yeah. It, that's that, such a great it's bit. So, it's so, so beautiful and perfect. And simple. The premise is simple. Mm-hmm. Doesn't take a lot of explanation, and he does such a good job. Nope. And I feel like I don't know if everybody's been in that situation, but I've been in places, you know, where you walk and you're like, well, "There's no music," and they're like, "Yeah, we unplugged the jukebox for that yeah. specific reason." So I, I feel right. like people can relate to it. One hundred percent. So was kind of comedy was kind of like, was that like a way to kind of diffuse bullying as a kid or? Um. That was definitely a big part of it. Uh, you know, I, I definitely got bullied pretty bad when I was, when I was younger. Uh, and then when I went to high school, I kind of had a chance to reinvent myself. So I went to a, a small private, like grade in middle school yeah. uh, that my parents had actually like founded. And then, uh, we all, Wait, your my little class, founded the school. Yeah, there was no like oh, no parochial. Pressure. <laughs> yeah, 
there was like no parochial Catholic school in our little town. So my mother uh, and my father set up this school with a couple of other families. Um, and it started with 84 kids. Uh, like my eighth grade class was 13. Yeah. Um, and uh, we all kind of went our separate ways for high school. So when I went to, I went to a private high school in, in Akron, Ohio, um, I kind of had this chance to reinvent myself. And uh, it was my mom who was like, you can be funny mm -hmm. when they're, when they're, you know, saying something to you, be funny, be funny back at them. Because not only will you win, other people will like you. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that was, that was big. And I also learned at a really young age that I could be funny to get out of like trouble with my mom. If I could make my mom laugh, it wouldn't, I wouldn't get in as serious of trouble. Yeah. So I always kind of used it as a way to, to relate to people and to talk to people and, and kind of break the ice. It's funny because when I was a kid, I was, you know, I was very kind of like outcast. Didn't, I, I found my, my, my herd in high school, but prior to that, mm -hmm you know, I kind of almost did the opposite. I was very quiet. I didn't talk to people. Um, and it took me kind of years to kind of like get over that and, and mm -hmm. to, to change. But do you think that was an advantage? I mean, it had to give you a tough skin just kind of dealing with it all. And then to get up on stage where you need that tough skin to be able to kind of mm -hmm. deal with the, Bad crowd um, or a bad night or bombing or not a punk so, ever bombed, Bob. Oh God! Anybody who says they haven't bombed <laughs> is lying. Yeah, there, there are two there are two types of comedians: those that have bombed and those that are lying. Um, but uh, like, I don't know if it necessarily that prepared me for it. I've been on stage and performing ever since I was little. I always was in you know, productions of, you know, little plays and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I always did talent shows and stuff. So I've always loved the stage and I've loved being on the stage and, and being around it. And, um, and so when I got to college, I tried really hard not to do that <laughs> for some reason. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to study international relations and be a diplomat. And then I took the 100 level course for that. And I was like, fuck, no, I'm not. Oh boy, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Uh, so I auditioned for a, for a play at the theater department, got in, changed my major. And if they had offered a major in stand up, I would have done that. But, um, but no, I ended up studying theater in college. And so I've just always been around the stage, been performing. It's something I've always loved. Yeah. It, it's weird. Um, I, I was always in drama and band and, and I always felt more comfortable on stage than off stage. Is that mm -hmm. something that mm -hmm. you, do you feel that too? Or? Um, the best, however you want to call it, five, 10, 15, half hour of my day is when I'm in front of a microphone. That's the, that's the most fun that I have ever. Um, I find a lot of peace when I'm up there. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's the pressure of, I want to be good. I want to be funny. I, I, you know, I want to kill this. I want to nail but getting up there, even if you're having a bad set, even if you're bombing, I mean, if you can get one smile, if you can get a chuckle, if you can get anything, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it is the single greatest feeling I've ever experienced in my entire life. It, and so you were talking about your mother saying that you should try to be funny. Have, were they supportive when you were like, I'm going to go be a stand up, or were they like, no? Um, I am blessed to have incredibly supportive parents. Yeah. I know for a lot of people in the arts, that's not, generally the case. Mm -hmm. um, but like my mother has every program from every production I was ever in. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I had this really kind of heartwarming conversation with my dad before I moved. Um, because I really hadn't done stand up or anything like that in Cleveland. And, um, I had been in a real rut for about three years before I moved and I hadn't done anything creative. I hadn't done any uh, plays. I hadn't done improv. I hadn't done anything. Uh, I just kind of got up and went to work and, and came home and played Xbox. And uh, I was worried about leaving because my father's old. He's 75 and he's got some health problems. And I was, I was worried about leaving because I didn't want to, you know, leave and, and not be there to take care of him. And he took me out to breakfast one morning and, and just kind of looked me in the eye and said, you have to go. 
said, there's nothing for you here. Yeah. You know, you, you have to go and do this. It's because if you don't, you, you know, you're going to die as a car salesman in Cleveland. And that's, that's no way to do this. No, not besmirching car salesman in Cleveland. It's, it's a great <laughs> career. But, uh, um, it's just, but it's not for everybody. I mean, it, it, you know, it's not for everybody, but it, it, that really meant a lot to me. So yeah, I've always had really incredibly supportive parents and, and, uh, they were really excited when I, when I booked my first road gig, which coincidentally was in a club about 20 minutes from where I grew up. So they all got to come and see it. And, oh, was um, that more nerve wracking or less nerve wracking? That <laughs> was terrifying. It was yeah. absolutely terrifying. Um, yeah, I, I started uh, touring with this hilarious guy named Sean Lynch, um, uh, who, you know, he created, uh, was one of the creators of Celebrity Deathmatch and like writes a lot for MTV. And stuff oh, like sure. That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, he he asked me, "Hey, do you want to come out and open for myself and this other guy at the at the Funny Stop in Akron, Ohio?" And I was like, "Absolutely, one hundred percent, I want to do that." And then after I agreed to it, I was kind of like, "Oh crap, what did I, what just did I do?" Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. at the at the time, I wasn't out um, as a queer individual to a lot of people in my life, and so I started getting all of these messages like, "We're coming." you know, from friends from high school and people from college, you know, people that I grew up with. And I have a big chunk of my set that's about, uh, that's about me being queer. And I was like, Oh, this is going to be, Oh, this is going to be fun. And to, and telling jokes about that stuff while looking at, looking at my mom. Oh, that's, is that, that's not how they found out. Was it? No. Um, <laughs> cause I feel like that would be a bad since, set. Yeah. Um, I've known since probably high school. Yeah. Um, I told them kind of off, like offhandedly uh, when I was younger, you know, 17 or 18. Um, and then bef- like right before I moved, I finally had, or before I, I went back to do the show, um, I kind of, I called them and said, Hey, we really need to talk about something um, yeah. because you're going to hear a lot about it. And uh, there I don't may be some people you want to let know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like uh, my brother came out and saw me perform when I was in Boston and I kind of had to be like, Hey, just so you know, like my, my set's not super family friendly and there is some stuff about my sexuality in there. Um, but he was super supportive. And, and so that was really cool to have that happen. Um, but it was difficult having that conversation with my parents and being like, mom, you're going to have to be prepared for somebody to call me a fag at some point. Like, like that's going to happen. Oh yeah. I, I didn't even think of that. I was just kind of thinking of that yeah. initial shock. And yeah. I didn't think of the backlash kind of that. Mm-hmm. Cause I, as a parent, uh, that would be, I think the most upsetting of someone insulting my kids. I remember my daughter was, second grade maybe and she came home from school and she was upset and i was like what's wrong she's like oh this girl was making fun of my voice she said i had a chipmunk voice and i was like i was ready i was like let's go beat up a yeah. girl i'm like let's go i, I have no problem throw down. Just, yeah. drop the gloves <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure i can take her <laughs> um so yeah as a parent i could see that being like really difficult were there people yeah. at the show that you weren't expecting to see yeah, there were a bunch of people I hadn't talked to in a long time that showed up. Um, you know, there was a guy that I knew very briefly in college that came and sat right in the front row. I mean, drove an hour to come see me and, and sat right in the front. And, and that was really cool because um, my closer is a story about college. So yeah, uh, that he was there for. So, so being able to see there and, you know, see him there and tell the story with him there was really cool. Yeah. Um, in Boston, not as much. I mean, it was really cool that my brother and, and my nephews and my sister-in-law came out, but, but you know, that's about the only people I know out there. So do you change your set a lot based on where you are? Um, I don't change the set so much, but I will change certain jokes. Um, so like in my opener, I, I talk about um, how deep at the core of my being, I'm, I'm truly just a 68 year old retired pipe fitter. Um, okay who drinks a lot of beer and eats a lot of sausage and stuff like that. And, and so I will, uh, I'll change the location, like where I'm from based on like where I am. So like, um, when I was performing in, uh, in Boston, I said, I'm a 68 year old retired pipe fitter from Lynn, I think is what I said. And then, 
um, you know, when I'm in, when I'm in Ohio, it's, it's Parma Heights. And, and when I'm in California, it's Bakersfield. Yeah. You know, so, it's so you kind of make it more regional just to kind of, yeah. Based on that. And that's one of the things that I do with Sean is, is when we land in a city where he's performed before, I'm like, okay, what's, what are the big things? Like what's big here? What can I kind of do a little riff on? What can I kind of throw in as a tag? <laughs> what city do I um, shit on? Yeah, well, who do I who do I talk talk shit about? I figured you know, that was the question when you brought up Lynn. I'm like, yeah, that's got to be what you asked. Yeah, I did. I was like, where where am I from in that joke? He's like, you're from Lynn, hundred percent. You're from Lynn. Yeah, that's fair. So, um, so how much of the time is this all you do now? Are you like a, a prof- I don't want to say professional comic. Are you solely a comedian, or do you? No, I do still have a day job. Um, I think where I would place myself is is uh, closer than not. Yeah. Um, so I do, I do still have a day job when the world's not ending. Um, I am still in the car business, but uh, I I have just recently started touring with him more frequently, um, and that has opened some more doors for me. Uh, which has been really cool. And um, I'm hoping, you know, with enough hard work in the next five years, I can be full time doing this and paying my bills. Yeah. It's funny. Like um, inebriart has been like really kind of booming and uh, me and the other guy who run inebriart, we're having a conversation at the end of last year being like, all right, what do we see in 2020? And you know, what's our five year plan, 10 year plan. And this was the mm-hmm. first time we were kind of like, okay, which one of us is going to quit our day job first kind of thing. Right. And, you know, who thought four months later, you'd be like, neither, neither one of us is going to quit our day job because, you know, right. the world wants to shit. But um, it, it's, it's a really, and I've been here before um, because I've been self-employed, but I, I remember the first time around where it was like, if I could work more, I could quit my day job, but I can't quit my day job until I'm working more. Like, is, is that kind right. of like where you're at? Um, I think where I'm at is just, I, I don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Um, because this is an incredibly expensive city to just exist in. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would definitely help. And also like, I'm still, you know, relatively i hate to i hate to use the word fresh still because i'm you know i'm not but um i'm i still am i'm admittedly have a very young career um so i think it's still just getting there you know um do you deal with um, sorry do you deal with uh uh, imposter syndrome at all where you're like oh so much oh my god so much oh my god the biggest like yes so much um, so when I moved to, to California, I hadn't, like I said, I hadn't done anything creative in like three years. I hadn't done actual stand up in longer than that. And I was scared. I mean, I, I was terrified. So I moved in February of 2018 and I didn't get on a stage at an open mic until November because a, a oh, so your coworker career just, is very, very new. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, as a, as a compliment, I had no idea when I saw you the other night. I'm like, this guy's really fucking funny. So uh, kinda, thank you. I, I just kind of assumed that you, you know, had a little more time. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. That was when you asked me to do this the podcast. I was like, does he know? Like, I don't know how much. Uh, you know, it, and this is the thing, and this is kind of the the premise of this podcast is when we talk to you know, someone who plays local bars and Mm -hmm. is kind of working on an album of their own that they, you know, haven't even played out yet. And then you talk to Mm -hmm. someone who would be, you know, a household name. People would know. I find Mm -hmm. their rationale and their feelings and their stories to be similar. It's just the name dropping is different. Yeah. Where like the local guy's dropping his brother's name and the other guy's dropping someone else's name that you're like, oh, I know who that yeah. is. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I just I think that's kind of the premise is, is creative people are all the same at all levels, and that's who we like to yeah. talk to. I just yeah, I totally agree. Um, but yeah, my imposter syndrome is is huge. 
Um, How do you deal with I it? I see. I'm still working it, on it because I, I have a very weird imposter syndrome. I'm like, someone's like, oh my God, you're famous. I'm like, I'm famous on two streets in Plymouth and that's it. So it's like, if I go yeah. beyond those streets, no one knows who the hell I am. Right. Um, I get it a lot. Just, I have a hard time talking positively about myself. That's something that my, my shrink and I work on, but like, uh, you know, I get a lot of people that are like, wow, you're really talented. You're really good. You know, you're going places. And I, I look around, you know, at these, these bars and these clubs that I'm in five, six nights a week. And I see guys who've been pounding the pavement for 10 or 15 years, um, who haven't done the road yet, who haven't done some of the stuff that I've done. And it's, it, I do get a lot of like, why me? You know, what, what about me is so, uh, different you know than all these guys that have put the time in and have done the work and who who probably want it just as bad as i do um but i think that the entertainment business especially is is you know part sheer unadulterated batshit insanity you've got to be crazy to want to do something like this yeah um it's it's part hard like very hard work um, and part being in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, the guy that, that I now feature for nationally, um, saw me on a night at an open mic where I just had a really good night. I had a really, really strong night. It went really well. I started doing some work with him and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm flying all over and doing shows with him and it just happened like that, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was a it was a right place, right time thing, I think. Um, also, I think I got some good jokes. So. <laughs> oh, I would, I would agree. Too. Yeah, no, I, um, <laughs> but it's interesting because I, I feel like because I, I myself struggle with esteem issues, and so I feel like sometimes that imposter syndrome is ramped up because you kind of get mm-hmm. into your own head. And being like, oh, absolutely. They're going, you know, normally the imposter syndrome is like someone's going to tell me that I don't belong here. And then the esteem kicks in and you're like, and they're going to find out you're a piece of shit. Right. You know? And, and so then that becomes like the struggle of trying to, you're not even necessarily selling yourself. You're trying to like talk yourself down. So you don't kind of shut things mm-hmm. down. Um, right. But uh, it, it's getting compliments can be very tricky. And oh, I, yeah. tend, I tend to crack jokes cause I'm super uncomfortable. That's exactly what yeah. I do. Yeah. 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 And people will be like, oh, you're so nice. And um, like my go-to is, shh, 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 shh. I like that bar set super low. Let's keep that under wraps. Um, yeah. You know, so so that's really, I, I can totally relate to that kind of, you know, not only feeling like you don't belong, but being like, ooh, why me? Why, why, why are you giving me this credit or this, you know, opportunity? Yeah. Do you work that into your set or is that something that you just try to kind of shut out entirely? Um, I have tried to talk about things like mental illness on stage. Um, and it just, I, I haven't figured out the way to do it yet. Mm -hmm. Um, I will at some point, I just haven't figured out the way to do it yet where it's, it's true. And it's funny. Like when you listen to somebody like Maria Bamford, who her, her mental illness is such a huge part of what she talks about and what she does, because it, it truly does define who she is. Um, her mental illness material is wickedly funny and very smart and so genuine. And I, I don't know that I'm comfortable enough to kind of comfortable enough with, with my own kind of issues to, to deal with that in front of a microphone yet. Yeah. Um, I had a really hard time coming out in front of a microphone. I mean, I, I had a really hard time, getting in front of, of audiences of that were, that are all, you know, kind of LA comics who are, you know, everybody here's fairly accepting and, and cool and, and getting up there and being like, Hey, I sometimes I'm into guys also. That was really, really hard for me. That took me a long time. Um, what, when you did were, was it one of those like where the worst part was the buildup and the anxiety and like, 
you know, I've had those moments where you're like, oh my God, you, and you're like panicking about something and then it happens and you're mm-hmm. like, yeah, that totally wasn't a big deal. The whole, the worst part was the buildup and me being in my own head and that sort of thing. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember, I remember that night very vividly and, and kind of coming off the stage. It was at my favorite open mic to go to, which is, um, here in Van Nuys. Can I shout it out? Is that okay? Oh yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, our, awesome. our only rule is if you're going to shit on someone, <laughs> maybe not use their real name. <laughs> Got it. Done deal. Uh, it was, it was at a place called the liquid zoo, which is on the corner of Sherman way and Sepulveda here in Van Nuys. It's a great mic run by a friend of mine named Ryan Tomo. Um, and I came off the, the stage from performing and I got a huge hug from another comic friend of mine that was that was there that night and she just said I'm really proud of you that was really brave and uh and that meant a lot to me and then once kind of that weight was lifted like okay I like I can talk about this I ended up finding some really great meaningful funny material about kind of my experience with that and what it's like being you know a a queer man because yeah. um, I think like at least in my experience when when uh, people find out that a man is is bi or like what I am pansexual um, the the initial thing is oh well you're gay it's, no, no I'm, I'm not do you ever wish me like I uh, wish it was that simple <laughs> I do I so much. I say <laughs> bye when I perform because it's yeah. just easier than explaining pansexuality. Yeah. Um, but I've gotten that a lot. I remember I had a comedian. Um, I was doing a show and a, a, a road show. I drove about an hour and a half to go to the show. And one of the comedians that was there was like, I just don't understand. I don't understand how you can do that. I don't understand how you can be into guys. And that still exists. Yeah. You know, whereas as I feel like a man coming out as, as buyer pan comes with a lot of kind of baggage and, and Oh, it's way different. Than if a girl comes out with, if a girl comes out as bi, it's a completely different story. Yeah. Uh, it is. It was hard. It was yeah. definitely very hard. I'm glad I did it. Um, but it was hard. It was tough. Yeah. So, to, I mean, this is how this podcast works. We kind of end up all over the place. But so, when you're writing material, do you try mm-hmm. to? So this is going to be a very roundabout way to ask this question. So okay. there's, there's kind of a stigma about female comics that you know people be like, "Oh, women aren't that funny." And Ridiculous. I realize, but okay. Very true. Um, it's just some people aren't funny. But the other thing is, like, a lot of it is just my perspective. You know, mm-hmm. like, I may not find a female comic that funny because I'm not female. So they're not speaking from a point of view that maybe necessarily I can see. So right. do you, is that something that you think about when you're writing uh, bits? Or do you try to kind of not make your whole act about your sexuality and kind of make it more broad appealing? Like, do you have to like have that kind of headset to be like, do I want to be, do I want to be a comic or do I want to be a bi comic? Do you know, does that make sense? So I want to be, I want to be, it does, it did come out right. I want to be a comic. Yeah. Uh, The the only adjective that I want used before that word would be good. I want to be a good comic. I don't want to be a male comic, a pan comic, a fat comic, a, a Polish comic. I don't want to be any of that. I just want to be a good comic. Um, you know, and I, I, I hate when I, I see stuff that's like, oh, yeah, with Mexican comedian, this person, or, or with female comedian, this person. What is, like, that doesn't matter. Are they funny? Yeah. End of story. Are they funny? If they're funny, who I don't care. You know, I think... In the, in the same way, I think it is important that you see rooms out here that are specifically for women, people of color, uh, queer people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, because because you need a space to be able to talk about things that are, are relevant specifically to that group. Yeah. Um, but when I talk about my sexuality, and uh, what I always try to do with my comedy when I'm writing is I try to get the audience to see through my eyes what I'm mm-hmm. seeing 
um, like that. I think I told this joke um, on the Zoom show the other day about driving down Van Nuys Boulevard and seeing a car seat on the side of the road. Yes. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, a million people probably drove by it that day, but for me, it was like, what in the world happens that you all of a sudden don't need a car seat anymore? Right. Um, so what I want is the audience to kind of be in that moment with me of this is ridiculous or this is crazy or this is disgusting or this is goofy or, or whatever. Um, I don't want them to, to get my humor from a bisexual perspective, from a pansexual perspective, from a male perspective, you know, from a, from a middle-class white perspective. I want them to get my perspective. Right. Well, that's just fucked up no matter who you are. Drop by. To oh, it was insane. Yeah. It was insanity. What so do you, do you, I have to know. Now, do you tend to take bits of your own life? Because there's different types of comedians. And are you more yeah. that you, you find the funny in your own life and try to then tell yeah. those stories? Yeah. So I would describe myself as anecdotal with just a splash of observational. Yeah. Um, uh, most of what I do on stage is true. I take true things from my life that were funny to me or meant something to me. And I tell those stories on stage. Um, I do have some stuff like, what's the deal with this? You know, but um, most of it is uh, like my closer right now is a bit about when I was in college, I ate 65 chicken McNuggets in an hour and four minutes. Um, Okay. And it's just kind of, yeah. That sounds like a terrible experience. It was awful. It was horrible. But uh, uh, it gets a great reception everywhere I take it. But, you know, I I like to take stuff, like, from my life. It's like, this is such a ridiculous, crazy thing. But it's totally true. And it happened. And and I want want them to kind of get that glimpse into my life and and what I I see and how I see the world. I think that's really the power of stand-up comedy is that you truly get a look in into someone else's psyche into the way that they view the world and, and the people around them. I think that's what makes comedy so unique. So, I mean, it's no surprise or no secret, I should say in the past three, four years, how, how divisive the country has been. Is that beneficial Mm -hmm. or is it hurting comedy because people are so on edge and um, I don't know if overly sensitive, but there there's, it seems like there are so many people with agendas that I, I tend to think of comedy as being the place to push boundaries. And sometimes things are funny because they're wrong, but mm-hmm. you know, and it's a fine line. You can easily step over, sure. but sure. do you find it's harder or do you think it's harder because of the, the, the general political climate and social issues going on? Um, that's a tough question. I think I don't do politics in, in my act at all. Um, but that's a personal choice. Um, but I mean, there's even parts of this country where if you were like, you know, uh, you did a great joke the other day, so I'm going to not do it justice, but essentially you were like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm by, by myself. And it's a great yeah, joke. I'm, I'm bisexual and single. And the sad irony in that is not lost on me that I'm attracted yeah. to both genders, but still single. So truly what I am is by myself. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that was great. Um, but I mean, there's part of this country where that I'm, I'm sure that would not go over well, just in general. So, I mean, even whether you're political or not, I mean, just sometimes someone's life topics could be considered political. Sure. Um, I've done that joke in places that, I guess traditionally wouldn't be as accepting of, of people with different lifestyles. Yeah. Um, I always preface my bit about my, my, when I go into my material about my sexuality, I always preface it with, by saying a little bit about me. Um, I am a bisexual man, but don't worry. You're all safe. That's, oh yeah. 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 You said that the other night. Yeah. I, I always preface it with that because, and then I usually I'll pick out a guy in the crowd and be like, except for this guy. Yeah. What's up with you? <laughs> um, because it, it immediately disarms kind of a lot of that. Like, I'm not going to stand up here and, and proselytize. I'm not going to stand up here and try to convince you that my way of life is right or wrong or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, but quite frankly, if you're offended by who I am as a person, you can go fuck yourself. Just, 
purely. Yeah. And simply put. And I think that's uh, something that comics generally share in common. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like, well, this is me, this is my act. You don't have to sit here and watch me, you know? Yeah. Um, Now, that being said, I wouldn't ever go somewhere and intend, like, I've run into guys in the scene out here who are like, oh, my goal is to get the, the biggest reaction I can get. You're not doing comedy if you're doing that. Like, you're you're just being a sensationalist. So I would never go somewhere, you know, I wouldn't go, I would say comical. I wouldn't go back to Cleveland and be like, boy, I love the Baltimore Ravens. Aren't they great? Who doesn't right. love the Baltimore? You know, I wouldn't go back and do that. Uh, I'm not going to intentionally kind of try to try to get a rise out of anybody. But at the same time, like if you're offended by who I am, I don't have any time for you. <laughs> And I think if that's if that's how you if that's your act, I don't think you're gonna have a very good career because essentially people are gonna be like you know people left like yeah the places don't want people to leave they want people to stay and have a good time. I mean the mm-hmm. only the only bit I can even think of like that was um, it's kind of a famous set by Bill Burr in Philly. God, I have no idea how many years ago and he was part of. Um, mm-hmm some radio tour and he, they, they were just brutal to like the, the standups before him. And he just mm-hmm. got on a stage for like his 12 minutes or whatever. and just insulted the entire crowd. And I remember that down. Like I got nine minutes left and then just kept like berating them. And it, it was genius, but you know, Bill Burry definitely kind of had a, he, mm-hmm. he was already established before he told that. Well, I don't know necessarily that, that Bill Burr is trying to elicit reactions out of people. I think Bill Burr is one of those comedians that very truly is showing you who he really is. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like Bill Burr is the devil on everybody's shoulder. But like, he is the imp of the mischievous in everybody's mind. That's, you know, what, ha- what, what if you push the button? You know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what he's like. In the same way that I'm sure, I don't know if you guys see this in Boston, but something that we're seeing a lot in L.A. is you're getting a lot of these kids that are fresh out of college who, who think they're the second coming of Anthony Jeselnik. So they just get up and talk about rape and abortion and, and all of this stuff, which like Jeselnik will do a half an hour to earn one joke like that. Yeah. You know, it, that has to be like, a, a, you know, I, I can't say that I go to a lot of comedy clubs, but my comedy is mostly YouTube and Netflix, which I feel is kind mm-hmm. of a general exposure to people but you know aj said made some comment about like oh you know this is the guy not you talking about um Mm -hmm. i think it was shamil and he's like oh he's the only one who got up at the open mic and didn't do rape and abortion jokes and i'm like is that a thing is that like a problem now yeah it's it's yeah especially out here where you get a ton of them and it's just (sighs) is it the new airline food maybe it might be the new airline food um, no, I think the new airline food is hacky Trump jokes, but, uh, uh, there are very few things that like bother me in comedy. Yeah. Um, because I think it's one of those art forms that's very truly like do whatever the hell you want, mm-hmm. you know, um, stuff like that where it's just, it's, it's just for shock value bothers me. Um, I don't. I don't like people using the word fag as a punchline and not because, you know, I, I like it, it hurts my feelings, but because I just think it's really lazy. Yeah. You're just, you're just trying to get a cheap, quick laugh off of, off of saying fag. And then, um, just, you can tell in an open mic who's prepared and who isn't. And, I understand it's an open mic and it's there for people to work out stuff and and it's it's an open microphone. I get it. But there there are people there that actually need to work on stuff and if you just want to grab the microphone and do, you know, oh geez, what else? Oh geez, what else? You know, I had one I had one tag that I wrote in the car on the way here, so let me try to figure out how to how to work that into, into a, a joke. Bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um you know, and that's, it's so funny because it's, and I've been to, I don't think I've ever been to a comic open mic, but I've been to plenty of musical open mics and I've gone to some mm-hmm. that are amazing where you're like, I would pay mm-hmm. to go to this show. Oh, and 100%. Then, absolutely. And then two months later, something falls apart and you're like, this is the worst open mic I've ever been to. Oh yeah. 
uh, is, is that the same kind of thing in the comic world? Oh, a hundred percent. And I, I, you get that with shows too. Like I've been booked on shows where at the same venue where I had a really awesome, super positive experience. And mm-hmm. then the other time was the worst experience that I ever had doing comedy. So <laughs> you, you get, you definitely get kind of the best of both worlds. And I think that's what part of what makes comedy so fun is that it's never the same night twice. You know, you might be telling the same jokes, but you know, I might get a response in a different place or I might get a heckler one night that kind of throws me off into something else. And now I've discovered something. It's, it's truly such a living and breathing art form. And I think that's what makes it so powerful and so beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to, uh, uh, do you know who Steve Hofstetter is? Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to, cause he's posting a lot on YouTube as he always is. Mm-hmm. And the one thing I like that he features, you know, some of the comics who are traveling with him and I, I wish I could remember the guy's name and he made some sort of comment about how he looked like a character from that guess who game that you had when you're a kid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, then like someone asked a question about hecklers. He's like, do you think I wrote that? He's like, someone shouted it at me at, at, you know, shouted that at me in the crowd. He's like, fuck, that's a good joke. I'm stealing it. Like hundred percent. That's one. that's happened to me too. One of my best tags was somebody shouted it out to me. <laughs> and you're just like mine. So took it and ran with it. It's mine now. So, <laughs> But um, is heckler is hecklers obviously it's something you have to deal with? Is it worse in like certain parts of the country? You know, um, so that depends. I think on the venue and and a lot of other things. But yes, I mean, in in middle America, um, you'll get more people that kind of want to participate. Yeah. Um, so kind of like the positive heckler. Y- yeah. You'll get people who think that they're adding to the show. Yeah. Um, and then like out here in LA, you'll get people who, who want to like correct. I've had people heckle me to correct my grammar in a joke. Oh my God. Um, that would kill me. I would, I would, Oh, first of all, I'd get that yeah. all the time, but I think I'd go ballistic. Um, or like I've, I've had people, who have, have shouted out um, like when I'm talking about my sexuality, like that's offensive. How is it offensive? I'm talking about me. I'm talking about my experience. I'm talking yeah. about my personal experience. How is my personal experience, you know, not okay. Um, but I do have a, a fairly graphic joke about oral sex. So I, can, I guess I can understand how it would, <laughs> it would come across that way. Yeah. Um. But how how do you deal with them? Do you just kind of tell them to shut up? Oh, I have stuff written. I think yeah. I don't I don't know if if every comedian does that, but I have something ready to go in the chamber for hecklers. Um, pretty much every night. Um, so I have a couple that are kind of my old standbys, and then I'll have some that might change depending on where I am. Um, if I want to make like a local reference or something when I'm talking about them, yeah. Um, but no, I have a couple of jokes that are written, ready to go for for a heckler. So if somebody calls out, I can immediately go right into that joke and it doesn't throw me off my rhythm too much. A lot of times I almost feel like they're kind of that old school bully where if you push back, they immediately like, oh my God, he heard me or like, oh, he's calling me out. Do you... You get that sometimes. So when you when you address them, they will, um, they'll start to get... You know, they think that they think that they're adding to the show, which mm-hmm. I think a lot of in a lot of hecklers minds, I think that's what they think they're adding to the show. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been around comedy for a long time and I've only ever seen a heckler get aggressive one. A lot of times they just think they're being funny or they want to impress their friends or something like that. So if you can kind of take them down a notch yeah. and then if they need another one, you, you hit them bigger. And then that generally you'll because I think especially the the area I think I can speak the most to is coming up as a comedian. That's something that scares a lot of young comedians. But the thing that you have to remember is you have the microphone. You're going to be louder. Right. right. And a comedy club is the only place where the louder person is right. (laughs) (laughs) So like, I mean, you said that you've been doing this like two, two ish years. So, I, I've been doing it seriously for about two years. I have been in and around comedy and doing stand-up comedy for a very long time. 
Now, is like, what's the end game? Like, what's your five, ten year, you know, plan? Like, what are you? Are you the type of shooting for a sitcom? Are you shooting for a Netflix no. special? No. Yeah. Like, it would be great. It would be awesome if it happened. But um, my goal has always been to get to where comedy pays my bills, and then anything else is gravy. Yeah. Um, I try very hard and this isn't something that's easy for me, but I try very hard just to stay focused and to look at, at the present and stay in the moment where right now I have to get ready because I'm getting on a plane in two weeks and in 10 days and, and flying to Ohio and, and doing five shows and doing a weekend. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm polished and ready for that. And then everything else I'll worry about when I get there. So how are you getting in in, in these unprecedented times, how are you getting ready? Like normally when you'd go on like a, an open mic or something and, and kind yeah. of, uh, are you like so, boring the shit out of your girlfriend with the same jokes over and again? Be like, how's this inflection? <laughs> so I'm, um, when it comes to my comedy and absolutely nothing else in my life, but when it comes to my comedy, I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those really annoying kind of comedians that I listen to the, the set. 20, 30 times. And I'm like, ah, I took a, I took a pause here. I took a one second pause here. Why did I do that? Ah, or, you know, on the I, said, there, I, yeah. I, I said like 14 times in this story. Why did I have to say like 14 times? You know, I'm that kind of person. So I've been listening a lot to, um, to longer set, like longer club sets that I've, I've done and being like, Oh, well I can cut this here and I can move this here and this can be polished up a little bit better. Um, I've been doing as many, zoom shows as I can get my hands on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so our, our plan is we're flying out on a Wednesday. Um, we'll land in Cleveland at, at five forty five Eastern, grab the car and uh, drive down and do an open mic uh, at the club just to, to shake the dust off and then um, wake up in the morning and do the radio and, and then hit the ground running on, uh, on Thursday night. Are you concerned at all about the, current state of affairs like performing in public, terrified but, um i'm do terrified you think, gonna, do you think this can be a good crowd or like i don't know what the feeling in is, is in um, ohio but i feel like they're a little more lax than us coastal people might be i i'm i don't know i can't i can't speak to it um because i'm not there i have family that's there and and friends that are there that are all doing the social distancing and everything but you know they opened up outdoor restaurant patio areas today and i know they were all packed so um the club is selling 50 tickets per show that's all they're doing um and the tables have all been distanced and all that kind of stuff but um no i'm 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 definitely i'm terrified i'm really scared about going yeah. um my girlfriend is is terrified of me going uh my friends a lot of my friends have been like are you absolutely crazy why are you doing this um it's it's really hard to kind of convey to someone. I feel like I'm so close to having the only thing that I ever really wanted. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is so hard to turn that down or, or to walk away from it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to travel as safely as I can. Uh, Luckily I work in the car business, which uh, they use a lot of those N95 masks. So I was able to swipe two of those before this all went down. Um, I was in uh, your neck of the woods. I flew LAX to Boston right when coronavirus first started, like right when it was first starting and people were talking about it. January, February, I think think it was January, February. Yeah. Um, I was actually in Vegas at a construction trade show and there's like a whole section of the trade show that is all like uh, companies, manufacturing companies from China. And we were the first mm-hmm. booth on the opposite side of that. So when I heard that the whole thing was breaking out and it's coming out of China, like we're all there. We're like, do we, should we be concerned? Like what? It, it was so like, we didn't know what was going on and you know, it was pretty scary. But the thing that, the thing that I've said to, to a lot of people is that I don't know that it would be that much different from me going back to work in my yeah. day job, my, my car job, you know, I don't think it's that much different than, than being in a building 
surrounded by people, you know, doing test drives and I don't think it would be that much different than that, but no, I'm, I'm concerned. I am worried. I am scared. Um, the thing that really kind of pushed me to, to say, yeah, let's do this. Let's go is, um, I posted about, about it on Facebook and a, a comic friend of mine that I respect said, um, you're giving us hope. And, and that meant a lot to me to where I was like, okay, this, this might be a, a little bit bigger than, Hey, let's go do a weekend in Ohio. This might be a little bit bigger than, than me and, and, and him. And th- this is important. I feel like. Do you ever get, I mean, like, like you said, it's a, it's a, you're early on in your career, but do you ever get kind of like that feedback from people? And this is tends to be where I get like the imposter syndrome where people come to me and thank me for what we're doing or, or someone gives me some sort of credit where I don't, I'm like, I don't, I didn't do that. I'm just trying to have fun. But do you ever have people, you know, be like, Oh, I tried an open mic because of you or, you know, you know yeah, I, I actually about what, whatever topic was difficult for me because of you, that kind of thing. Yeah. I had an old friend from high school that said, you gave me the courage to go out and do an open mic. Um, you tell me he's terrible right after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was, he was, he was 2000 miles away when he did it. But yeah. uh, I thought that was really cool. Like, you know, seeing you go up and do it, gave me the courage to go out and do it. I thought that was really neat. And I, I hope, I hope he's still out there doing it, but um, this this is the thing that makes me the happiest. It's telling jokes and 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 doing comedy. Like my happy place is being on the road. It's it's being in those hotel rooms and in those clubs. You know, the basement of some club somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, drinking drinking Bud Light out of a cooler and, and eating spaghetti <laughs> that the, the club owner's wife made for us, you know, like that. I love it. It's, it's, it's the greatest thing I've ever experienced. You know, some days I still kind of have to wake up and pinch myself and be like, you're really doing this. This is really happening. Um, and I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm getting there and it's, it's, it's really, it's really fucking cool. It's what, really, really, what's fucking, been like one of the most, uh, surreal moments for you thus far like where you're like i can't i can't believe i got to do this or i can't believe i got to hang out with this person or um doing doing my first road gig in in the comedy club that i like grew up in was was really cool like do like getting paid to get on a plane and fly back home and go to this club that was 20 minutes from where I grew up. I used to go to it when I was in high school and college and see shows there. Like getting up on stage and grabbing that microphone, I was like, wow, this is real, you know? And, and having the cell phone number of the guy that created the show, I used to sneak downstairs to watch because I wasn't allowed to. Yeah, is to sneak back downstairs after everybody went to bed to watch Celebrity Deathmatch, and now I'm I'm touring with one of those guys, and it's like what, that, like, oof, came a long way. Yeah, it, um, I, I uh, interviewed a musician right before the whole Corona thing, and he's like, oh, you know, he's like, there was this band that, you know, I always wanted to meet, and now we're touring with him. Like he knows my name. Like it's not I met mm-hmm. him. He knows my name. And, yeah, and those are always kind of those weird moments that I think. Yeah, and then you know I have some stuff coming up later this year that I can't. I'm not really supposed to talk about yet, but like that kind of stuff. Um, I hope it still happens, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Um, like I, I moved to California. Uh, like I said, not having done anything creative in a long time, I had three thousand dollars in my bank account, and me and my best buddy from high school packed up what fit in my Ford Fusion and drove to California. And to go from that to to where I am now, um, it's been one of the most challenging and rewarding things that I've ever done. Um, and even if if this is as far as I get in comedy, mm-hmm. that's okay. Like. I did it. I chased it. 
Well, let me ask you. So obviously you love it. You don't regret it. It's mm-hmm. you're doing what you, you love to do. What's the shitty part? There has to be. I mean, I love what I do, but there's still parts where I'm like, ugh, I got to, you know, go post, you know, create event posts and the tedious mm-hmm. part. Like, what's the tedious part of stand-up comedy? The part that we don't see. Um, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's absolutely exhausting. Um, you know, you go on the road and you do two shows, you know, on a Friday night. And then you go out to the bar afterward with the other comedians and the audience members. And, you know, you have some drinks and, you know, you get back to the hotel and it's three in the morning and you're just exhausted. And then you, you don't get great sleep and you wake up and you do it all again the next day. And it's, it's awesome, but it's exhausting. Um, it's sometimes it's hard to sit through open mics and be like a good yeah. supportive member of the community. Um, it's, I hate when people find out you're a comedian because the response is almost always tell me a joke. Uh, tell me a joke. Yeah. And then out in LA, it's what have I seen you in? Oh, well, okay. like, yeah. yeah, nothing yet, but hopefully soon. <laughs> um, I mean, there are definitely, like I said, you have to be really kind of nuts to want to do this um, because you are really kind of making yourself bare and vulnerable in front of a bunch of drunk people, hopefully very drunk people. The drunker they are, the better. So, right, right. Um, do, do you those ever, are the two big ones. Do you ever have... You know, like I, I see a lot of um, comics, they'll talk about their wives, their girlfriends, their husbands, whatever. And I'm always wondering, I'm like, do these people have conversations with their spouse before they rattle this off? Is there like the conversation mm-hmm. where, like, this is not stage worthy? You do not discuss, you know, our sex life or our financial Like, Are there taboo things that, you know, either your girlfriend or our past significant others have been like this is not for stage oh sure like there are some things with my girlfriend now that i just wouldn't talk about on stage Mm -hmm. because they're they're deeply personal things between the two of us um she knows that i talk about her on stage uh she likes most of the jokes that i tell (laughs) about her um um and and i i i show her them and if i think it might be close if I think I might be towing the line I'll be like hey sweetheart listen to this and tell me what you think and yeah and and you know see if it's okay um because I think as a comedian you have to kind of find the balance between um people in your life being people in your life and people in your life being characters in your comedy right um like when I'm on stage, who I am is a car- kind of a caricature of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I, t- I turn my accent up. Uh, you know, I, I change my speech patterns a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm making fun of the things about myself that I think are funny. Yeah. And that's what I do about, you know, with her, with being British and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, my dad with kind of, kind of being out of touch, but trying to be hip. Uh, and my mother just being genuinely the funniest person I know. Um, they all appear in a lot of my stand-up. Um, and the ones, the people that I talk about um, that maybe don't know that I'm talking about them, the names are changed. You know, it's, I'm not out here to, to, to hurt anybody or, or anything like that. I just, I think these things are funny and I think that it will make people laugh if I say them. So, yeah. So you, so you turn up the Ohio accent because I, I don't. Oh yeah, I don't really oh, hear yeah. it all that much. It's I, gotten much better now that I've been out here for for a while. But when I go back home or when I'm drinking, ooh yeah, ooh boy, yeah uh, I, yeah. She makes she, she makes fun of me all the time for it. I, I dated a uh, a girl from uh, Chillicothe, Ohio. 
Oh, I know Chillicothe. And uh, yeah. she'd be like, you talk funny. I'd be like, I live here. You talk funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, uh, it seems like my a- my A's get really exaggerated and my yeah. S's are very sharp. And um, like the phrase, yeah, all right. When I say that, I have to think about it in my head because just for me, it's all right. Like, oh, okay, yeah. you know, little things like that. Yeah. But I make fun of her for saying trousers and banana and that kind of stuff. So yeah, my, I think my, it evens out. My, uh, my housemate is British, so there's a lot of times where, you know, I'll be like, where's the aluminum foil? And she'll be like, yeah, ah, she hates that one, though. She hates that <laughs> when, people, when people ask her to do that. She yeah. hates that. Uh, you know, you start to be like, oh, blah, 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 the flat. And she'd be like, why are you saying that? And I'm like, because I know you know what that means. And I'm like, right. So where can people go, our listeners, um, to to hear your bit? Do you have a YouTube channel? Do you have a podcast? I mean, you're a stand-up comedian. You have to have a podcast, right? Isn't that how it works now? Is that is that the rule now? I thought um, that was the rule because it seems like every uh, friggin' stand-up comedian has a podcast. And I'm like, I love your stand-up, but boy do i not like your podcast <laughs> that yes there are there are, like there was one i used to listen to religiously that's just gone so downhill and i just ugh. um but uh you can follow me on instagram at big mcclure that's b-i-g-m-c-c-l-u-r-e or please add me on facebook bob mm-hmm. mcclure um you will also get hilarious text conversations between me and my mother and she is hands down the funniest person i know so uh, it's it's that's a good time for everybody involved. Do, do you have a, a funny uh, mom story you want to relate? Oh yeah, God, up. so many. Um, my mother, every time I used to bring a date home, mm-hmm. would always ask, uh, "So, uh, why do you like my son?" That was the first question she would ask <laughs> as soon as I sat down. Why do you like my son? And they would always go, "Oh, you know, he's funny." And my mother would go, "Yeah, he's funny looking." <laughs> <laughs> And she thought it was the funniest thing ever. Yeah. Um, uh, like one of her, one of her cute little pet names for me is Jackass. So I get, a, there are a lot of texts, like exchanges between us where, where she'll refer to me as Jackass and things like that. Um, no, she and I have a really positive and really strong relationship. And she loves, she loves to tell people about like when I was three years old, they were drying, a, my parents were drying one of those red igloo coolers in the, mm-hmm. in the kitchen. Yeah. And I was, bear in mind, I'm three. I was three years old when this happened. Uh, and I guess I, I just decided that would be a great time to go ahead and pee in the thing. So I just, in the middle of the kitchen, dropped her out and, <laughs> and peed in the igloo cooler. And she has told that to every girl that I have brought home. Because you're marking ever. it for your own. <laughs> yeah, it's mine now. Yeah. So she tells that story to every girl I've ever brought home. Every girl, like, yeah. My mom, my mom loves to throw shade. She's, she's very funny. Yeah, I love... I have that kind of, you know, my kids love to kind of like take shots at me and, you know, they'll beat me in a board game and I'll be like, that's fine. You're adopted anyways. And Ah. uh, it's, I, you know, kind of like going all the way back to, to your uh, initial statement of, you know, your mom told you to be funny and kind of take the power away from the bullies. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my favorite things to do is to, you know, get a good insult in on, in on my buddies, but even better is to insult myself and take the insult away from them before. they. Get oh yeah. hundred percent. That's like the best part. Oh, cause you get, you get to see just the look of like dejection, like, dejected, like Damn it. Just sadness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? So, uh, that, that my mom, my mom used to feed me lines to say to kids that were being bullies to me when I was a kid. Yeah. She was, I had, there was one kid that used to make fun of me in French class. He used to call me fat in French class all the time. And she goes, well, the next time he calls you fat, Robert, you just say, yeah, well, I can lose weight, but you're always going to be ugly. <laughs> and, and I said that to him, and, and it, yeah, my mom would just feed me lines and stuff like that, too. So she's yeah. a hoot. My, my favorite dig that my daughter has ever gotten in on me was, uh, so we we're dry, we were on the car. My, I can't, my kids were, oh, this was quite a few years ago, so they were pretty young. And at the time, you know, I split with my ex. And so I didn't introduce them to, pe- to people I was dating. And, and mm-hmm. my rule at the time was, if it's not serious, they don't get to meet them. And so my son was probably 11 or 12. So it's like six or seven years ago. And um, 
we were having a conversation and I was saying something about how like, oh, you know, someday you'll be able to grow a beard of your own. And my daughter pipes up. She's like, didn't he tell you? I'm like, tell me what? And she's like, oh, Grammy found a beard growing out of his chin and ripped it out. I'm like, buddy, don't let her do that. And he goes, why not? And he goes, why not? I'm like, because ladies love the facial hair. And my daughter would do. My, it's right. And my daughter, yeah, without missing my a girlfriend beat is, goes, is very explicit about that. Yeah. My daughter without missing a beat goes, then why are you so lonely? Oh, <laughs> shame. And I was like, oh my God, I am so crushed and proud at the same time. And it's like the only, it, com- the only comeback I had was fuck you. And I couldn't say that to her. Does, is it Hofstetter who has the bit about going to IHOP with his kids and his, his daughter oh. accidentally says the funniest thing in the world? Is that Hofstetter? No, no. Hofstetter uh, doesn't have kids. I know exactly who you're talking about. It was something oh my about... God, who um, is that? Oh, I isn't, know exactly. Like, he, he gives them a passport and he's like, Yeah, can't and they're like, isn't this the International House of International House of Pants? Oh my God, I just watched a special with him <laughs> oh, too. is it Steve Reed Azizi? Yes, I think that's who it is. Oh yeah. my God, that was killer. That and he, oh, yeah. about how his son was stupid too. Like, oh yeah. yeah. Oh my god that that that's a great that's a great bit. Um, yeah. Shout, shout out to him. Yeah. There's that another really there's another stand up and I'm gonna ask you this because maybe you'll know because I can't I heard the bit and I can't remember who the comedian is and it was like one of those bits where like I was crying I was laughing and it's about uh-huh. how him and a friend of his in high school were left alone in a home at night for whatever reason. Oh, uh, Matt Bronner. It's Matt Bronner's uh, homeless girl. Yeah. yeah. Matt Bronner. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what yeah, I'm talking Matt about. Matt Bronner's right, homeless girl. Now, and now, then, yeah. Was that like, I knew that in two seconds. Yeah. At least now it has been that's recorded. A so, bit. Oh my God. I could have killed her. <laughs> uh, that's a hilarious bit. So who are you listening well, okay, to now that you, to... <laughs> um, that you would recommend? I listen to a, I listen to a lot of Patton Oswalt now. Yep. Um, I just love the way that he, he plays with language and the way that he plays with words. Um, I listen to a lot of Gary Gallman, um, because I think he's the best joke writer alive. Um, I've been listening to a ton of Ian Bag also recently. I don't know him. Uh, he's a Canadian guy. Uh, he, I think he lives out here now, but, um, he is, is just wickedly and deeply funny. Um, and then if you if you want somebody who's who's kind of got like a queer perspective on things, James Adomian is great to give a listen to. He has a really, really great bit on the archetype of the gay villain. But how a lot of like Disney villains and villains in movies kind of have stereotypical gay characteristics. Right, right. Kind of the underlying tones of that. It's a whole it's a deeply, deeply funny bit. It's a very, very funny bit. Oh, nice. I'll have to check them out. Um, yeah. And Kathleen Madigan always holds a special place in my heart. I don't know her at all. Kathleen Madigan, Kathleen Madigan is, is, is every, everything that is wonderful about the Midwest. She's just like this sassy old Irish lady who smokes and drinks and, and just a, as a Midwesterner, mm-hmm. I identify so much with what she talks about. It's just, she is wickedly, wickedly funny. She is so funny. So definitely check out Kathleen Madigan. Oh, we'll definitely have to check that out. Uh, Bob, this was an absolute pleasure. I want to say thank you. For oh my God. I had so much us. fun. Um, next time you come out to Boston, I'm definitely gonna have to find out where you're at and check it out. And Oh, absolutely. I'd love that. I'll heckle from the crowd. Do it. <laughs> get, get never, my canned I, responses right I yesterday. would never have the balls to do that. Like I, I just, I wouldn't either. I feel like it's such a shitty thing to do to people, but oh, it's um, so awful. But yeah, no, I, I I thought you were really funny the other night, so I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what else you got up your sleeve. And I best of luck it. to you, and stay safe in Ohio. Wash your hands, and uh, yeah, you know, thank you. I mean, wash all of you, but wash your hands extra. Yeah, no, I'm only going to wash my hands <laughs> while I'm there. That's the only oh, the thing. plane ride home would be really interesting. Oh God, I'm not looking forward <laughs> to it. Ugh. Um, yeah, this was great, and uh, so I yeah, I had so much check fun. You out. And uh, don't be a stranger, man. No, same to you. Thank you so much. Stay safe out there. Best to you and the, you and the family. And thank you again so much for having me on. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, you can find us on all social medias at inebriart, except for Instagram, we're at inebriart6. You can email us with your questions, complaints, and whatnot at inebriart at yahoo.com. And if you're looking for more podcasts, you can check out the other podcasts on our network, uh, Retro Red Octopus, uh, America's Hometown Horror, and, of course, Bar Talk, Old Colony, and an EBR podcast, the original. Um, so check those out and subscribe and comment so we can reach more people. And thanks for listening.